Hi, my name is Nina, and I'm one of this year's team co-captains. My name is Amy, and I'm the other team co-captain. So, um, a couple of dates have already passed, like the parent info day, as well as the student info day, and the pick a sub-team days, which this video is a summary of. Um, a couple of other important dates to note is that the applications must be submitted by this Tuesday on the 8th, and um, until the roster is finalized, we'll be having seven recruitment days um, that you'll be working with the sub team that you ultimately choose. So we have five sub teams um, in our, on our team, and the one that you select on your application will be the one that you stick with for all of your time on the team. Um, and if you do want to switch sub teams, you will have to reapply um, and be judged with the same criteria as the other recruits in that year. So we highly encourage you to apply for the sub team that you would like to. Um, and we can always provide you with other resources for if you would like to participate in something in something FRC related. Um, so in this video, we'll, we have all the summaries for the different pick a sub team days. Um, please do check the description for um, timestamps if you're looking for a specific um, sub team. Hello everyone and welcome to Art Team. We are the art sub team on Pali Robotics. So first of all, who are we? Well, my name is Shohan. I am the current art sub team captain. I joined the team in my freshman year and am currently a junior now. And these are the rest of the art team members. So what exactly does art team do? Well, you heard a little bit about it during our info sessions. We mainly produce 3D animations for competitions and make designs for our team merch. So firstly, animation. When we're working on our animations, we're generally working in Autodesk Maya for the actual 3D animation portion of it. And then we edit our animations in Adobe After Effects. We enter for two competitions every year. The first safety animation competition, which is a animation regarding safety rules around the robotics lab. And the second is a digital animation award. So that animation is allowed to be more freestyle, whatever you want it to be, as long as it fits within the theme of the year. In our actual animation process, we usually start with storyboarding, getting a story idea, and then creating assets and props to put in our sets, which we also create so we can animate our characters in them. After we animate our characters, we then add cameras and lights and render our scenes so they can be exported and edited by our editor. We add visual and sound effects, and then we have our final product that we can submit to the competition. So today we're going to show you three of our past animations. The first, this animation is a animation for the safety animation award. The first award I talked about, the one that has to have all the safety rules in it. Alright, so as you saw from this animation, we tried to fit as many safety rules as we could within the time limit. The next animation that we're going to show is an entry for the Digital Animation Award, the other competition that I talked about. And this one was for the theme Deep Space.
All right, and then last but not least, the last animation that we are going to show today is one of our off-season animations. So off-season animations aren't submitted for competitions, and they're generally practice animations that we make, as the name suggests, during the off-season to brush up on skills that we haven't used in a while or to practice and experiment with new things. Alright, so that was our off-season animation, and all the animations that we've shown today have all been produced by Art Team, and the skills that you'll need to produce animations like these will be taught during recruitment. Next, moving on to graphic design. So when we work on our designs, we are typically using Adobe Illustrator or Affinity Designer, two very similar designing um, softwares. And we make t-shirts and hoodies, so all the apparel for the team, as well as keychains and buttons, which we take and give out at competitions, as well as other more unusual merch items, such as pop sockets, socks, lanyards, and even hats. So here are two examples of past merch designs. The one on the left was for the past season, as indicated by the date. Um, for the theme sustainability and infinite recharge. The one on the right was for the year prior and is a hoodie design for deep space. Generally for graphic design, we produce one year t-shirt design, which is for the theme of the year and a hoodie. So speaking of the year, what exactly does a year look like for an art team member? Well, in October to early November, we are producing and working on our first animation for competition for the Safety Animation Award. And then in late December to early January, we are working on our second animation for competition, the Digital Animation Award. In late January, during build season for everyone else, we are working on the year t-shirt and the hoodie. In February, we're working on making buttons and keychains to prepare for competitions because we need a lot of buttons and a lot of keychains to hand out per competition to make sure we don't run out too quickly. In March and April, we're attending competitions with the rest of the team. And at competitions, we also participate in scouting and we can go and socialize with other teams in the pits or hang out in the stands with our own team members. Then is the off-season period where we can work on other projects such as our off-season animation or personal projects. And then in late July, early August, during the summer, we participate in our annual summer camp where we host a animation and graphic design session. Welcome to Business Something Day. My name is Nicholas Shingal and I'm a junior and this year's business captain. Hi, I'm Victoria. I'm this year's um, business project manager, and I'm a junior. Hi, I'm Caroline. I'm a sophomore, and it's nice to meet everyone. Um, I'm Sophia. I'm a junior. And Ashley, I'm also a junior. Hi, guys. I'm Diego. Um, I'm also a junior, and I've been a part of business team for a number of years now. Welcome to business team. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to talk about a little bit of what we do, who we are, and how you can get involved with the business team. 
So here we are as business team. Uh, we already did a brief introduction, um, but here's a picture of us. And here's another. At its core, business team is really about three main functions. The first is writing awards. The second is marketing and branding. And the third is fundraising for the team. So first is awards. There are four main awards that Pali Robotics applies for. The Entrepreneurship Award, the Chairman's Award, the Engineering Inspiration Award, and the Woody Flowers Award. And these awards all are unique in the fact that they have their own criteria um, and they all have uh, different processes to apply for them, but they're all similar in the fact that um, they're really important uh, to the team in different ways. So you might be asking, what are awards and how do they work? So as you may know, Pali Robotics is part of this big organization called FIRST, which works somewhat like a sports, uh, sports league. In addition to having these robot competitions for our robot to compete in, they also give out awards to uh, commend the efforts of individual teams. So our first award is entrepreneurship, which focuses on how well our team is organized. Uh, to apply for this award, our team creates these comprehensive business plans describing everything that our team does, everything from our history, to our organizational structure, to our finances. And as you can see, we, have, uh, we create graphics and charts to show how our team has progressed over the years. Uh, we create these um, designs and programs such as InDesign um, to make a really nice aesthetically pleasing plan to submit to judges at competitions. The next award is Chairman's, which celebrates a team that is really the ideal first team for other teams to emulate. Uh, it focuses on the impact of a team and uh, how well it is able to interact with its community. So there are four main components of the Chairman's Award. The first is the essay, uh, then it's a short answer, the video and presentation. Uh, these parts are all unique, but they all offer a different way for students to get involved with this award. For instance, if you're interested in video editing um, or film composition, uh, the video is a great way for you to uh, get involved with the team uh, and uh, provide your expertise um, and contribute to the Chairman's Award. The presentation is another great way to get involved because it uh, focuses around public speaking and dressing up in these costumes to present to judges. Uh, so it's another great way for people to get involved with the Chairman's Award in different aspects. The third award that we're gonna talk about is the Engineering Inspiration Award, um, which is similar to the uh, Chairman's Award and its goal to recognize a team with a good impact on the community, but it's different in the fact that it focuses on the specific um, mechanical device that a team created. For instance, a few years back, one of our members, Victoria, reached out to a local quadriplegic man and uh, worked with the rest of the team to build a, a device that would ultimately allow him to communicate. Those kind of things, th that's what we're presenting in the Engineering Inspiration Award. Finally, uh, the, the next award is Woody Flowers, which focuses on the contributions of mentors to Pali Robotics. As you may know, Pali Robotics has numerous parents, adults, and teachers uh, who contribute to the team all in different ways. Uh, so Woody Flowers Award gives us a chance to commend their efforts and show how they've impacted the team in a positive way. In order to do this, we kind of answer this question, what makes blank mentor so great? And we use facts, emotion, and anecdotes to show this. So that was awards, one of the three main parts of Pally Robotics. The second is marketing and team image. Uh, through which we use a variety of social media and community engagement platforms to show what our team is about. So, do you use social media? And if so, do you follow Pally Robotics on social media? If you may, if you don't, go ahead and give us a follow. Because uh, social media is a really valuable tool for marketing and Pally Robotics employs numerous accounts um, to kind of provide the community with updates on what we're doing and get our message out there. That's why we ask uh, people to follow us because uh, we want to get our message out there more and we want more people to know of what we're up to. So Pali Robotics uses social media in a few distinct ways. First is our student feature post on Instagram where we highlight the contributions of an individual team member. We also connect with other first teams um, who also have social media accounts. Um, and we also give updates to the community about what we're doing and how they can get involved. So for instance, if you look through our Facebook and Instagram page, you'll see competition updates, for instance, uh, about what we're up to and how we've done a competition. So social media is a huge part of Pali Robotics because it's really important to uh, our maintaining an, uh, an impact on the community and it's a really great way to get involved. The final part of business team is fundraising. 
as you may presume, running a first team and building a robot from scratch every year is not cheap. So business team is in charge of securing the necessary funds in order to make sure that our team runs smoothly and effectively into the future. There are two main ways that business team does this. First is sponsors and the second is grants. So for sponsors, as you may notice, uh, Pally Robotics has a few um, major sponsors that you may uh, be familiar with within the community. For instance, uh, Apple and Google are huge companies located in Silicon Valley that fund the team and help us uh, then by providing us money directly. Other organizations such as Kirk Steak Burgers and Asian Box is another one of our sponsors, provide the team with food during build season. Organizations like Emotive and SolidWorks provide the team with software. So there are numerous ways for companies to get involved with the team, um, but they also uh, are really important because they help us maintain our funding and maintain our uh, operations as a team. So the next uh, component about how we fundraise our team is grants. And grants are a little different than um, sponsorships because we aren't directly emailing or reaching out to a company. They're essentially a company saying, we're going to uh, allocate X amount of dollars uh, to a team uh, to, with the purpose of doing this, uh, with the purpose of uh, increasing STEM access or providing more opportunities for students to go to competitions. And these uh, amounts are normally somewhere around $2,000, $3,000. Uh, and they're distributed with uh, specific purposes in mind. So when we apply for grants, we have to essentially convince that company, we have to answer their questions and we have to convince them why we are the best organization, why we're the best team to be receiving that money. And in order to do that, we include things like charts, uh, statistics, graphs, anecdotes, all that stuff um, to convince a company that we are the best uh, organization possible to be receiving their donation. So as you may notice, uh, grants are non-repayable. So uh, when they're given to us, that's our money to use. Uh, and the purpose of them is to achieve a goal that the company set out. So whether it's increasing STEM access or making sure robotics is available to more people, once we get that money, that's what we try to do with it. So another big component of Pally Robotics is outreach. Uh, you may have noticed Pally Robotics has numerous outreach programs uh, throughout the community um, that are really important to maintaining our connections. So uh, examples of our outreach opportunities include robot demos, workshops, our annual summer camp, which you may have participated in, our Lego Robotics Summer Program, which is a free summer program for underrepresented uh, students, uh, our visit from a all-girls town uh, grammar school in England called Townley Grammar School. Uh, they come uh, to the Silicon Valley every year uh, on their STEM visit, uh, and the team hosts them in the lab and shows them what the team has been up to. Uh, we also created a picture book for young students in the community to let them know about STEM and uh, a little bit of how they can get involved. Uh, and we also mentor FLL and FTC teams. Uh, and there are numerous opportunities to get involved with outreach, both on business and on the team as a whole. So this is a really big part of what Pally Robotics does, and it's really important to our team. So you might be asking, what exactly are we going to be doing in these next few weeks? Well, if you choose to stick with us, which we really hope that you do, we're gonna be working to try to prepare you uh, to develop those skills that we talked about earlier so you know how to run a successful business social media account or to apply for sponsorships, things like that. So when you're a member of the team, you feel more prepared uh, to complete these things. So as a schedule, uh, it might be a good idea to pause the video here and take a picture of it. Um, this is a, an outline of what we're gonna be doing together over these next few weeks. As you can see, there are seven meetings um, that we're going to be together. And in each meeting, we're going to cover a different topic. So it's really important that if you have the ability to, that you attend all these uh, different meetings because they all are gonna cover something different. Um, as you can see, it's about two hours. It's very informal, um, but we hope that you can attend if you are able to. So as far as commitment goes uh, to robotics, I'm sure you've heard a little bit about this at Info Night, but just to kind of add on to that, um, obviously we don't know about uh, whether we're gonna be going back in person as of now, um, but just based on the commitment that we've been structured in the past, it's typically you go into lab um, Thursday and one weekend day during the off season, which is essentially September until December, during distance learning and our current situation that typically um, rounds out to about two hours a week of just 
of work um, with the team and it's very flexible right now, obviously. Uh, during build season, it's closer to uh, around 10 hours a week you're in the lab because it's open every day. And this typically isn't difficult for students to get. Um, I know the common perception is to think that, oh, this is uh, a huge commitment during build season. And while it does take up a significant amount of time, it isn't a difficult thing for a lot of students to get because our lab environment, even if it's going to be virtual this year, is super uh, fun for students and it builds a sense of community where kids are going to want to come back into lab as much as possible. So it's not a difficult requirement to get. Um, after May, it goes, sorry, after March, it goes back into a uh, one weekend and one Thursday thing. Again, uh, subject to change um, given the current situation. And like I said, during summer, there are numerous opportunities to continue getting involved with the team, um, especially with outreach, with programs such as our uh, summer camp, things like that. Um, and we encourage students to stay involved during the summer as well. So if you have any questions about the team, uh, feel free to email me at nshingal, N-S-H-I-N-G-H-A-L, at polyrobotics.com. Uh, we would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have, and we really hope that you join business team, uh, and we'd be super happy to have you. So thank you so much for uh, coming to Business Pick a Sub Team Day, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you. Today we're doing build team pick a sub team day. So we'll go over some general Zoom rules that apply for the recruitment process. Um, so please keep your camera on at all times, display your first and last name, and keep yourself muted when others are talking. You can raise your hand physically or through the reaction if you have a question, and please use your common sense and be respectful to everyone. And if you haven't still joined the Remind, please do so. It will give you all the information that you need and it's very useful. And I should probably introduce myself. And my name is Taiki and I'm the build team captain this year. So I'll talk about what we do throughout the year. So currently we're in the off season and we do teaching to the new recruits and to the sophomores so that they are able to use the machines proficiently. And we build the off-season robot that we use to compete in the off-season competitions. And some people would like to do personal projects that further their abilities in either any of the machines um, or electronics and as well as CAD. And then we are the busiest during the build season. So during the build season, we like to prototype first, and then we machine a lot and assemble our robot and we iterate on that robot. And then during our competitions, we fix the robot to, in the pits to make sure that during the competition and each match, the robot is, is in its best condition and all its functions are able to uh, work. Some opportunities that we, our team has, uh, so that includes CNC and manual mills, CNC router, lathe, bandsaw, miter saw, circular saw, hand tools, a lot of different hand tools, TIG welder, metal bender, and 3D printers. So we machine all of our parts in-house and we have all the tools necessary for our FRC needs. And we do also electronics for the robot, pneumatics for the robot. And we use CNC softwares like VCarve and CAM to be able to operate our CNC machines, which I'll talk about later. And some people like to also CAD, um, which is because it's a really good and handy uh, skill to learn. And some people also even design on the robot for the robot. Some expectations um, for safety and also the mindset. Even though we're not at the lab, since build team usually uses all the machines that are very dangerous, heavy, and can do a lot of damage, we always wanna prioritize safety. Um, so we always follow our rules of the lab and that makes sure that 
we're out of harm's way. And we'd like to see during the recruitment process, people that are very committed and will take initiative and actually are interested in robotics. Because those are the people who will actually be able to be successful on the team throughout the four years of high school. And so that's what we'll be looking for. So some of the expectations uh, for hours during the season would uh, include for the off season, six hours per week, uh, which is one Thursday lab hour day and also a weekend day. So during the off season, the lab is open on Thursday and the weekends. But on during build season, the lab is open every day and recommended um, hour requirement per week is 10 hours for 12 weeks, uh, which leads to around 120 hours. But most people who are interested and all really like to go to lab will surpass that very easily and is never a worry for anyone. And of course, because of COVID, these could change. Um, and so we'll do a machine tour because during the pick a sub team day at the lab or in person, we always like to do a machine uh, demonstration tour. So we use the power drill a lot during, in our lab and we use it to assemble the field by drilling pilot holes, which are made to ease the wood screw process. And we also drill out small holes to larger ones, like with the top right image, where you see many are uh, just machine parts on the CNC router that we need to change the size of the holes to match whatever diameter we need. So we can use the drill and a drill bit to change the size of the diameter of the hole. So we can also do countersinking, which is basically taking this tool on the right over here and we take out the burr, which is what's the sharp part of the hole. So it kind of shape makes a trapezoidal shape after you countersink. Um, and we also use it as temporary prototyping motors. And so during the prototyping process, uh, we like to use it to power our machines. So I'll share for you. This. So as you saw in there, we were using the drill right here to power the axles of this intake prototype that we made during the last season. And so here we were testing out how efficient or how well the intake would handle six balls. And it was very, very efficient and very well. And here, Just goes like, turn around. we also Go. show the intake, same intake prototype. But here we're just showing that we can intake the ball from at, it, uh, at any angle. And once again, we're using the drill here. Go, go, go. But of course, we don't always use the drill. Um, eventually we'll turn the, we'll finalize the prototypes and we'll turn it into a, a fully motorized where it's just a, just a motor and not an actual drill powering it. And we also use the miter saws very often during the first couple weeks because we use it to cut all of our two by fours and two by fours are used for the field. So we can do straight cuts and angled cuts. And as you see on this top right corner, this is a blueprint of parts that we use for the field that we're given. So here we would have the correct dimensions that we need cut and then the quantity. And yeah, we're exactly where we're gonna use this. And then we can also use the specific miter saw that has the metal, um, metal cutting blade. So most wood uh, miter saws or miter saws used for wood cannot cut metal. So you have to have a specific type of blade that's able to cut, cut also metal. So we have one of those. So we like to use it to get a rough estimate cut on any metal tube stock that we would use, but that we would um, very specifically cut down later. We're using the mills, which I'll talk about later. 
So we would maybe, if we really needed exactly uh, 5.425 inch uh, piece, then we would cut using the miter saw down to maybe 5.7 inches or 5.75 inches and then shorten it using the mills later. And we also use two by fours on prototypes, as you can see right here. This was one of the final, one of the later stages of the prototype. So you can see it basically creates the whole structure of it. Some hand power saws include circular saws and the jigsaw. So the circular saw we used very often because we need to cut any plywood, which is not very thick, but it's very flat. It's flat and very large in area. So as you can see right here, once again, blueprints that show a trapezoid, another trapezoidal shape. And here, this is a, I think, half inch um, plywood that we needed 11 of four of and 10 of these. So we would use the circular saw by first drawing out the dimensions on the wood, and then we use the circular saw to cut those parts out. Um, and then the jigsaw is very uh, similar in diff uh, how, it, how it can cut, but we would use it a lot less because it can perform a lot slower than a circular saw for many things, but it can do different shapes because circular saw has a blade that moves up and down unlike a circular saw or a jigsaw has a blade that goes up and down unlike a circular saw that has a saw that goes spins around and is like a disc so the jigsaw could be used for perhaps if this plywood had a circle in it we would not have any other machine to do that a circular saw would not be able to do that because you can't just cut here so we use a jigsaw First, drill some holes big enough for the blade, and then we would cut the inside out. So the bandsaw is a very important machine because we use it for also cutting a lot of our stock into rough um, estimate dimensions that we need to use. So that could cut either the tube stock that I mentioned before, or it could even cut um, sheet metal, which is flat and a lot more thin. But of course, the bandsaw, like the other machines, are very dangerous. So there's a lot of safety, safety protocols that you have to make sure you follow or else it can cause major injuries. And that could even lead, lead to like a lost like a uh, finger gone and no one wants that. So we always want to be safe around all these machines and especially the bandsaw. So uh, here, here is a part that's been machined on the CNC router. And so as you can see, there's some tabs, that's what we call these like extra pieces of metal that weren't cut to make sure that these parts don't fly out after um, the machine finishes. Um, so they maintain its uh, position within the metal. So we would use the bandsaw to cut those tabs after we've finished machining it. And then we can sand it down later. And yeah, we can also cut plastic, wood, and aluminum mainly. That's what we usually use for our materials. And here's the drill press. So the drill press is very similar to the drill, the power drill that we talked about, except it is stationary. So here I'll show you a video of operating on the drill press. So here he is basically pulling the lever down uh, while the spindle spins with the drill bit in it. And he's basically changing the diameter of the holes by drilling it out to a different size. Um, but since the drill press table is not exactly perpendicular, because nothing is going to be exactly perpendicular like that, there's the possibility of the metal piece starting to gain caught by the drill bit pinching and then spinning violently out of control and the only way to stop it is to turn off the machine and by that then 
um, stopping the spindle, but that could also lead to injury, like getting hit on the hand, like you can get cut, get a really bad bruise, like things like that. And so you want to always use either vices or clamps to put, keep your piece down because it hurts a lot if you get hit by this. So here is a video of what you'd like to see used. Um, so you have the vise and the three clamps holding the vise down onto the table. So it is the most optimal setting. So we move on to the manual mill. So the manual mills are industrial grade heavy duty machines that will not forgive anyone for not following the rules. So you never want to leave these machines unattended while on and you don't want to ever want to get distracted while operating them. So we do three main operations on the mills. Uh, they include facing, drilling, and slotting. So facing is the process of taking away material and also making it flat um, and perpendicular perhaps in our case. So here's a video of facing. So here, as you can see, he's taking away material off this tube stock and it leaves a very clean finish and it is uh, perpendicular to this body of the cylinder. So we want to make it perpendicular and flat um, because we can use that as a reference to make precise holes. So that's drilling. And then slotting would be perhaps if you use this tool and then start moving into the body and you take a little, I guess, slot out of it as the name suggests. Or as you can see in the image, that would be slotting right here. The lathe is also an industrial grade machine that will not care about your little slip ups. So you have to be very careful, especially with any loose clothing, jewelry and long hair. If you get caught by the spinning cart, which is called a spindle, you'll have a face full of metal and that'll hurt a lot. So we usually make standoffs, spacers, and sometimes rollers and rarely threads. So standoffs are perhaps something like a little cylinder that keeps um, two pieces of sheet metal together after you bolt it. So here is an operation of facing. So this is like the mills where you're facing because you're making a perpendicular and flat to the body. So, but one key thing that you might've noticed is that the lathe is a little different from the mills because here the lathe is spinning the part, whereas in the mill, you're spinning the cutting tool. So here the lathe spins the part and then you move the cutting tool into it while that which removes the metal. And here we're drilling. So this is, I believe, making a standoff. And so we always drill the holes as well on the standoffs. So the threads are, um, to very briefly explain what threads are is, if you have anything that screws on, like a cap to your bottle, um, that's basically what threads are. You are threading this part onto here, or you could thread this inside here. So basically threads are kind of what screws have or bolts have. And we can also make these on the thread on the lathe, but for our purposes, we don't usually need to do that. And here we have a couple of machines, known as CNC machines. And CNC machines are computer numerical control. That's basically a fancy word for saying process of computerizing uh, machines. So the CNC mills 
we have two of them, are exactly like the manual mills, except they're, they can be compute, computerized um, fully. So no, no one has to actually operate it. It just does it on its own after we tell it the instructions or code. So it could do very precise and specific commands that no human could probably do uh, realistically. So this is a time lapse of the CNC mill running. So first over here, it was drilling and then we switch it out to an end mill and then it starts doing these pockets. So it does these very specific uh, shaped pockets that first we would, the design team would design and then we would use G code to machine that. And here's the CNC router. So the CNC router is just like the CNC mills, except very large. So it has a very large workspace that you can use to either do box beam or tube right here um, and drill and also do these pockets. Or we have a whole workspace that we're able to put sheet metal and then do those parts that those L shaped parts that I showed you before. And the CNC router is, ex our CNC router is extremely um, professional and one of the top is top um, best brands that make these CNC routers. So is extremely fast at producing parts and yeah, extremely good. So we were very fortunate. Um, of course, if you still have any questions, just ask me during maybe big build uh, recruitment process or maybe shoot um, Nina or Amy, our team captains, an email or a message through Mind. Thanks for listening. And I hope to see you during build team re recruitment. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Design Pick Accepting Day. My name is Kyla and I'm currently a senior and also design captain. So who are we? These are a couple of photos from the past couple of years and with our most recent photo in the top right corner, which was a sunrise hike that we had last year. It's missing a couple of people, but this is essentially us. So what does design do? Essentially, we design the robot using CAD. And in this case, we use SolidWorks and you guys will actually be learning to use a different software that's pretty similar, but it's absolutely free and it's online. Another important role that we have on the team is prototyping. So in the first couple of weeks at the beginning of the year, we test all sorts of different kinds of mechanisms to really find out what's going to be the best to go onto our robot. So what you'll learn. On design, you'll learn also all sorts of different design, FRC design fundamentals from using motors and pneumatics to gearing. And then we also teach you how to use machine, machines and power tools. You learn how to CAD and also a little bit of math and physics. So what your potential year may look like. So currently we're in our virtual recruitment phase where we'll be evaluating teamwork and then later on we'll have our off season after recruitment well, where you'll continue to learn how to use machines if lab is open and also hone your skills. During the season from January to February, once again, if lab is open, you'll be helping with build, um, creating parts and also assembling. And then if lab isn't really open, then you'll continue with some design projects. During our competition from March to April, hopefully we'll be able to compete in competitions and really have that kind of team spirit and great vibes. During the off season from May to June, after we finish competition season, we'll continue on CAD projects. So basically, during that time, a design recruit, after you kind of spend your first year with Build, you're still technically a design member. So you, you, know, you don't have to reapply to re-enter design, you're still on design. So after competition season and during off season, that's when you'll really be honing those design skills and learning to CAD again. And after that, for the, for the next couple of years, you'll really be integrated into design and presenting mechanisms and whatnot. So a couple of expectations. 
during the year, we really expect commitment. So typically there's 120 plus hours expectation in build season. However, this might change whether or not we have lab or not. Honestly, it's really easy to get to that 120 mark. I think every single member on design got well over 200, 300 hours during build season. Now, of course, worth ethic. We expect you to be respectful, honest, and really hardworking, of course. And of course, willing to ask for help anytime you need it, and just professional as well. So attitude, we expect you guys to be really positive. Of course, you know, whenever you're facing challenges, it's really easy to get frustrated, but go into it really wanting to learn and really wanting to participate in all of our activities. So lots of people ask about whether or not technical knowledge is required. So actually you can go into this with absolutely no technical knowledge. We teach you basically everything you need to know. Pretty much I think the majority of everyone on the team, I think actually everyone on the team currently, when they first got on, they knew nothing about robotics for the most part. Even myself, I knew nothing about robotics. I knew, did not know how to CAD. I did not know anything about robotics. I had not, never done anything related before. So just as an example. So don't need to worry about that whatsoever. And the last thing you'll need is a laptop or a computer to run on shape, which like I said earlier is free and all you need is some Wi-Fi. And then last but not least, most importantly, have fun. The whole point of this is to really develop a passion and interest in design. And of course, our activities are meant to be fun for you guys. So what exactly is recruitment going to look like? Essentially, we're, we're going to be having a lot of design activities to look at your guys' teamwork and personalities and whatnot. So for instance, today during Big Stepping Day, we had a design activity where you were designing a mechanism. So this is just one of the examples of what it could be. Finally, lastly, if there are any questions, you can always find me and email me on the website through my email. Or you can also email any of our, any of our team captains if you have any other questions about recruitment or design team. Thank you, and I hope to look forward to meeting you guys all during recruitment. Hi all, welcome to the virtual Pick Us Up Team Day. This is the Pick Us Up Team Day for software. And basically what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be giving you more information on what software does, as well as trying to um, give you more information on how the recruitment process will work as well. So before we start, uh, please follow the instructions on the slide displayed. Text those set of characters to the number 81010 to get remind notifications. And this will basically notify you every single time we have a recruitment meeting. And uh, it will also give you other important information. So once again, please follow these instructions. It's very important. So what does software do? In short, software's job is to make the robot functional. We are trying to write the best possible software for our robot so we do the best in competitions. And yeah, that's, that's what we do in short. We use programming languages like Java, Python, and Bash. We primarily use Java, but other, the other, other languages are used sometimes. We incorporate tools and other features such as autonomous and teleoperated robot control, vision processing, control systems, path following, we do various sensor integration stuff and even more. We also use important tools like GitHub and you'll learn important skills like Linux, et cetera. So here are two cool videos of our robot. So generally this is one aspect of what software does. As you may recall from the actual student info day, the game challenge this year was to try to create a robot that could not only pick up, but also launch these yellow dodgeballs that were placed very in various places all over the 
game field. And so we had to create a robot that could manipulate these game pieces and actually launch it into a goal several feet above the ground. So as you can see, this is a goal. And so in the first 15 seconds of each match, we were supposed to create a pre-coded autonomous sequence, which automatically did a set of things and tried to give us the most, maximize our points. So in this case, we were trying to score as many dodgeballs as possible within that five sec within that 15 second period. So here's one of the cool videos of our robot. So that was one of the videos of our robot. Once again, it once again it was able to pick up those two dodgeballs in the front, and it had three balls to start with, and it was able to launch all of those into the goal entirely autonomously. Here's another vi video of our robot. So once again, in this video, we shot five balls, we picked up three and we shot those three. So we were able to score, I uh, know we, sh we shot three and then we were able to pick up three more and then shoot those three. So we were able to score six balls within that 15 second period. So generally speaking, this is one aspect of the entire software, robot software development, but there are other aspects too. So I, I wanted to give you a broad software analysis of our robot for 2020, which was called Nari. So this is actually the same robot we'll be using this year, but we'll just be making some major iterations to try to improve the actual, some, some of the flaws we had with the previous design. So again, we, our robot can be broken down into multiple subsystems, right? multiple different parts. So one part of the actual robot control was, was the drive subsystem. What the drive subsystem allowed us to do was actually move the robot in the actual field. So we could drive the entire robot around anywhere throughout the field so that we could go and pick up balls and we could move to places to actually shoot. And then we also had an intake subsystem. This is the subsystem that actually allowed us to pick up the balls. So this entire mechanism can be actuated downwards and we can run these belts to actually intake the, the balls into our robot. Then we had the indexer subsystem. The indexer subsystem just moved the balls from the actual intake up to the shooter mechanism. And the shooter mechanism basically just launches those dodgeballs out. So one of the cooler parts of our robot this year was the shooter software. So Basically, if you think about any launching mechanism, right, or if you, let's take a common example of you, uh, you're playing basketball, right? You have to shoot your basketball into a hoop. There are two, two main parts into getting that ball to accurately fall into the hoop, right? The first part is making sure that you're aligned with the goal. So you have to make sure that you're not offset uh, by yaw. So you have to make sure that you're completely aligned so that when you actually launch the ball, it will actually land in the same plane as the goal and you. And then also we need to make sure that we can control the arc, the actual basketball travels, right? So same thing applied, same thing was applied to our robot this year. So we use, some vision processing. So th this is our vision processing camera right here. So we're able to do some vision processing to calculate where the actual goal is on the field. And then based on that, if we're off, if our robot is offset from the goal, we can automatically align to the goal. That's the first aspect of it done. The second aspect was ca calculating the actual trajectory for the ball. So once again, if we take the comic, 
example of playing basketball. When you're actually calculating the arc the ball should go, you're actually controlling two things. You you're controlling the exit velocity and you're controlling the exit angle. Two things, right? So we, we can do the same thing with our robot. We control not only the angle the ball is launched at, so we have this hood mechanism, which allows us to shoot the ball at a variety of, a variety of angles. So we have a variety of departure angles for the actual ball. And then we are also able to control the speed of the ball when it's launched. And we have this thing called a flywheel mechanism, which spins up to speed and allows us to actually launch the balls forward. So we can use a combination of that and we can use, once again, vision processing to calculate how far we are from the goal. We can use that distance to the goal. We can figure out, we can figure out what speed our shooter flywheel should go at. So we can calculate how fast the ball should be when it's shot. And we can calculate what our departure angles should be. And then we just send that data to the robot. And then the ro robot will immediately do exactly as we programmed it. So what that does is it allows us to shoot from anywhere on the field very accurately. So if we're right in front of the goal or if we're maybe five meters away, 10 meters away, it automatically does the calculation as to what angle and what speed it needs to launch the ball at. So this allowed us to have very, very accurate shots at competitions. Yeah. So we also like to develop other software tools that increase the productivity throughout the eight week build season. So time, we, we get very small amounts of time with the actual robot because within that eight weeks, we have to get designed to actually design the robot. We need to get built to manufacture and actually build that robot. And then we need to get designed to make more iterations on the robot. And then we also have to take the robot and start writing code for it. So whatever time we have, we like to maximize that time as much as possible. And so we create and develop other software tools throughout the off season and whenever possible to try to increase our productivity and our workflow. So we create these applications in Java, Python, et cetera. And yeah, they generally help us increase our productivity throughout that software season. So our team values. Generally, we value commitment, teamwork, problem-solving skills. We value independence a lot. We, we value your ability to do research and try to figure it out on your own. But we also value when people ask questions where necessary. So there's a fine line there. We, we like people who take initiative, who try to learn something new on their own people who try to figure stuff out on their own. We also value, we also generally like to have a good sense of humor because we don't wanna to be too serious either. Yeah. So this is the main part. So for the actual recruitment, the way it's gonna work is we're gonna have two sections. The first section is going to be learning slash review of Java. And then the second section will actually be creating projects, both individual, and in a group. And so, again, for that first part, what we're focusing on now, we have three different lanes. So no matter what, what your proficiency in Java is, you can join one of these lanes. And then we, we're basically going to try to get you up to speed as to how to program in Java. So if you've never coded in Java before, then we recommend you go to the beginner lane. Or if you've done like the, the bare bones, most simple stuff, if you have coded in other languages like Python C or C++ and you're very proficient at them, so maybe you know a bit of object-oriented programming in Python or C++, or if you've been doing Java but you only know maybe like conditionals, loops, arrays, functions, but haven't really dabbled in classes and object-oriented programming, then go to the intermediate lane. And then the advanced lane is for those who are already familiar with object-oriented programming, have used classes in Java, and are have generally they have they have worked with these kind of things. So, yeah, I would like to heavily emphasize that no matter what lane you pick, you're not going to be evaluated on being like we we don't take prerequisite ability into uh, 
our calculation for who should get on the team. We, we, all of the skills that you will need to be on the team and to be a successful member on the team, you will learn through actually being on team. So when you're actually writing code for the robot, when you're creating different applications, et cetera, that's where you actually learn a lot of the skills. So what we're evaluating you on, if you might remember from the previous list, nowhere did it say that we're evaluating you on your actual coding abilities your initial coding ability. So regardless of whether you're in advanced or you're in a be beginner lane, that's not ac actually going to affect your chance, your chances of getting on the team. Yeah. And you'll actually be sticking with wh whatever lane you choose for the next few days. So you'll be working as a group with wh whichever lane you are in. And so please, if you have any questions as to what lane you need to be in, you can just email me. My email is aoberai at pallyrobotics.com. And I'd be ha happy to help you with making that decision. I also have my email on the next slide, so you can copy it down then. Yeah, once again, you will not be judged for whatever lane you choose. Choose the lane that is best for you so that you can learn as much as possible and then you can actually apply that knowledge into the projects we do later on. Okay, so yes, please keep that in mind. Attendance. So if you're not able to attend in any one of the recruitment days and you don't want that to affect your chances of getting on the team, please email me and let me know what your reason is. So once again, this is my email right here, aoberai at pallyrobotics.com. And just let me know the reason and we won't take it into account when we're making our decision. So if you have any further questions, once again, you can use that same, same email. You can forward questions to me or you can ask me any questions and I'd be happy to give you a response to those. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Thanks for coming to this virtual software recruitment pick a sub team day. Yeah, hope you have a good rest of your day. Hi, I'm Chris Kuzmal. I'm the head coach for Team 8, Pally Robotics. Welcome to Team 8. I'm looking forward to meeting each person who's new to the team. And having been away from the team for a couple of years, I'm looking forward to uh, reintroducing myself to students who I had as freshmen and students who joined the team since then. I'm going to tell you a little story, and I hope it makes sense for why, why I'm telling it. Um, a few years ago, my son was on uh, a, a robotics team that was undefeated. It didn't lose a single match the entire year until it reached the world championships. Um, and then, even then, it did quite well. And I remember worrying about my son because but worrying, I, I, I have this value that I don't really want. I don't want my students or my children. I don't want even myself to care whether you win a world championship. But I certainly cared about how my son would feel. I cared that he, I wanted him to be able to have the experience of, of winning, winning big. It's a, it's a rare thing. You can, win things but of all these things that that are behind me that represent winning in some way the things that are most uh motivating to me the things that are most meaningful to me looking forward are not the championships or the certificates or the trophies they're the things that actually don't represent any prize at all the rocket that my daughter built i'm looking forward to seeing it fly again it's not a trophy. It's something that represents actually doing something. Hope it doesn't fall over. It wants to fall over. Well, maybe I'm pushing too hard, right? Um, or this robotics kit, right? I mean, it's just, it's a, I don't know what a robotics kit. It's a uh, kit of parts, unopened. I ordered it over the summer. And this is exciting to me building a robot 
even if it's just a standard kit of parts robot, I think that's a lot more exciting than any of these achievements or trophies or certificates. So that's going to be our challenge because uh, we're, we're a world championship quality team. Uh, the question is, is that going to be something that empowers you, makes you excited about building things? Or is it going to be something that paralyzes you because you're afraid of failing because you're, the expectations you have for yourself and the expectations others have for you are so high? It's going to be hard sometimes in that way. And what I'm here to do is to help remind you and help you have the perspective that all that matters is you as a person and the community that we're in. We absolutely are going to be very determined about winning every single match we can on the field this coming year. But no year has been more clear in delivering the news to our team and the world that you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen on the field. All you can do is be who you are. And that's what teammate is really about. And whatever happens on the field or doesn't happen on the field, this team is going to be a, a place where you can be who you are and where you are welcome. Welcome to teammate.